Hi, everyone. I am excited to be here to be part of the Take the Lead launch. I want to start by thanking Gloria Feld, not just for organizing this today, even though that's amazing, um, but for being an inspiration to me, uh, to countless women. Gloria has been a combination of practical and a visionary, and those two things are so hard to go together and inspire as much as she does, but she's inspired me and I know so many others. So it is a tribute to her, I think, that we're all here. So I'm gonna ask you to do something. We're gonna start out. I'm gonna ask you to stand up. If and only if you have said out loud to another human being, it must be an actual person, not your dog. <laughs> I am going to be CEO of a company. I'm going to be governor of a state. I'm going to run a major nonprofit. Stand up if you've said that aloud. It's a hard thing to say aloud. Thank you. That's a difficult question. I'll let you know that having done this with other audiences, that was the most people I ever saw stand up. So congratulations. And I'm glad for those of you who stood up, but it was still, if I had to estimate, 20% far less than half. And so I'm here today to do one thing, which is try to inspire every single one of you next time that question is asked to stand up. Not just to be CEO or run for governor or run a major nonprofit, but to fulfill any ambition you have without holding yourself back, without thinking you can't do it. I want this for all of you. There are some men in the audience, men and women, but I especially want this for the women because as Gloria is pointing out, we are not making enough progress in gaining our share of leadership roles. And that progress, progress at the top of corporate America and other countries has really stagnated over the last decade. Trends that go up for 30 years, it went up from the 70s to about 10 years ago, and then are flat for 10 years, you have to worry that they will not go up again, or worse yet, go down. And that's why Take the Lead is so important. Take the Lead is not just an abstract thing, it is about every single one of you in this audience. So we're going to spend our time today thinking about what holds us back. There are a lot of reasons, every woman and every man, but every woman does not stand up to a question like this. We're held back by institutional bias, sexism, discrimination, terrible public policy. All of those things have to change. But we're also held back by things within ourselves. So I want you to take a minute, and I want you to think about why did you not stand up? If you didn't stand up, the 70 or 80 percent out, out there, why not? Just take a minute and think about it. I'm going to offer you three reasons, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand when I get to your reason, and it can be more than one for many of us it is. So the first thing, please raise your hand if you did not stand up, because you're not sure you can do that job. I mean, it's really hard to be a CEO. You're not sure you have the skills. Raise your hand. Self-confidence is a major determinant of what we can do. And here's what we know, what the data shows unequivocally and clearly, which is that compared to men, women have less self-confidence for a number of reasons. When performance is evaluated, men and women, if they perform the same way, everyone, including the individuals themselves, remembers the man's performance a little bit high and the woman's performance a little bit low. Many of you have heard of gender-blind studies teachers grade tests without names. Uh, employers look at resumes without gender bias names. People audition orchestras behind screens. Every single time, what do those tests find? That when it's gender blind, women do better than they do when it's not. Why? That's because we systematically underestimate, underestimate our own abilities. And more importantly, all of us and the individuals ascribes success differently. When a man succeeds, he and everyone else ascribes it to his own skills. When a woman succeeds, she and everyone else ascribes that success to working hard, 
help from others, and getting lucky. Now, those are really different because if you succeeded because of your own skills, the next time someone asks if you can do something, you're ready to raise your hand. But if you succeeded because of help from others or getting lucky, well, maybe those won't come the next time. I just finished an entire book on this topic, telling other women to be more self-confident. And in this book, I share pretty openly the times when I haven't been self-confident. But even once I finished writing the book and promoting the book, this still happens to me. After the book was long turned in, there was a meeting at Facebook, and there's a, one of our technical leaders, Jay Preek. There's a project he and I both wanted to do for a really long time, but no one agreed with us. And then over the Christmas holidays last year, people decided they agreed. So we had the kickoff meeting for this project. And we start off, I talk in my book about bringing your whole self to work, I'm pretty open. And we start off by, I start off by saying, I'm just so glad we're all here. Because for all of these years, I wanted to make this investment and no one agreed. Jay looks up and he says, I knew Cheryl and I were right, you'd all come around. <laughs> so I'm Facebook messaging with Jay later that night, Jay, can I use that story on my book tour? Oh, sure. He's a really nice guy, so I wrote, Jay, don't worry, I won't make you seem egotistical. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> I think this is an area where knowing the data helps. If we wait, and this is for my two, if we wait to feel the self-confidence, to know we can do it, we will not raise our hand and sit at the table. So don't wait for that. Take a deep breath. Remember that you're sitting next to someone with Jay's confidence. <laughs> Take your seat at any table, and over time, you'll know you belong there. Second thing that holds us back. <laughs> Second thing that holds us back. Raise your hand if you didn't stand up in front of thousands of people and say you're going to be CEO, because that's just distasteful. I mean, who likes anyone who's that openly ambitious? Raise your hand if that's not the kind of thing you walk around saying. So when I talk about ambition, I want, to I want to be clear about what I mean and what I don't mean. What I don't mean is that every single woman should have the ambition to be CEO of a company or should have the same goals I do or any one particular person does. We all need to pick our own life's path. I also want to be clear that what I don't mean is that there aren't women out there who are as ambitious as any man, because of course there are. But here's what I do mean, and I want to say it unequivocally and clearly and unapologetically, and this is a perfect place to say it because this is what Take the Lead addresses. By middle school, by middle school, more boys than girls want leadership roles, a trend that continues into adulthood. By sixth or seventh grade, if you poll girls and say, do you want to be president of your junior high class? Do you want to be president of your high school class? Do you want to be president of your college class? Do you want to run for office? Do you want to run the company you just joined? Every single time, more men than women say yes to those leadership questions. And it's not really surprising because we are socialized this way. At my wedding, I'm the oldest of three. My brother and sister stood up and they said, hi. We're Cheryl's younger brother and sister, David and Michelle. But we're not really her younger brother and sister. We're really her first employees. <laughs> employee one and employee two, because Cheryl never really played as a child. She just organized other children's play. <laughs> and that's funny, and it's true. But there's something underneath that joke that's actually not funny at all. Go to a playground this weekend, watch little kids play, and I promise you will hear a little girl called bossy. You will not hear little boys called bossy, because when a boy leads, it's expected and it's not negative, but when a little girl leads, even if it's on the playground, on the playground, she is told not to with that word. As we grow up, bossy becomes something else for adult women. It becomes too ambitious, too aggressive, pushy, out for herself. Because we ascribe leadership as male, 
because we expect men to lead, to be self-confident, to be supporters of their own agenda, to lead others. We accept leadership openly and we like men who lead. But because we don't expect those same characteristics for women and girls, we want them to give to others, speak when spoken to. We are all raised this way. We react negatively. That's why as men get more successful and powerful, we like them more. As women get more successful and powerful, we like them less. This is something we can change by understanding it. So this weekend, go to a playground. Wait, it'll take just a few minutes to hear a little girl called Bossy. Walk over to the person who said it, who's probably that person, her mother or father, and say with a big smile, that little girl's not Bossy. That little girl has executive leadership skills. Third thing that holds us back. Raise your hand if you haven't said aloud that you want to be CEO or elected in elected office because you want kids or you have kids and you want to be a good parent and you're not sure you can do both. My friend Peggy had a friend whose five-year-old came home and told her mom, mother she had a problem. She said, Mommy, I want to be an astronaut. This was before NASA canceled that program, so that wasn't the problem. <laughs> she said, I want to be an astronaut. And the little boy I like, he wants to be an astronaut too. Mother said, well, that's great. She said, oh no, oh no. We can't both go to space. Someone has to watch our kids. And I think it'll have to be me. That five-year-old girl is smart because the data is really clear. It's going to be her. From Pat Mitchell, who was just out here, who's been an amazing mentor, and guidepost for me from her generation to mine, we have made more progress in the corporate boardroom than we have in the home. Because even as women have come into the workforce in overwhelming numbers, even though 40% of women who are working are the primary or major contributors to their family's income, we still assume that women can't do both. And even when a couple, a heterosexual couple, both work full time, the woman does 30% more housework and 40% more childcare than the man. This assumption changes how we approach careers. Think about career as a marathon. You get to the start line, men and women equally fit and trained. You could argue with women's educational attainment outpacing men, the women are better trained, but I'm a generous kind of person, so let's give the men equal. <laughs> you get to the start line, gun goes off, marathon starts. What messages to the men here? You've got this. Keep going. Good start. What about the women? Right from the time they enter the workforce. You sure you want to start this race? Does it make sense to start a race you may not finish? Don't you want kids one day? The race continues. Voices get louder. For the men, you've got this. There's the finish line. Keep going. For the women, they get louder too. Why are you at work when your child needs you at home? Men in this audience who are in the workforce, please raise your hand if anyone's ever said to you, should you be working? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I've never gotten a hand in any country ever done this. Women in the workforce, please raise your hand if anyone's ever said to you, should you be working? More than 70% of the women with children in this country work. They work full time because they have to, to make ends meet. Our message is that women can't do what most women have to do are a huge problem. And the fact that we still don't pay women as much as men for the same jobs is an even bigger problem. Maria Shriver just put out an amazing report, and one of the things she writes is that if women were paid as much as men, we would cut the poverty rate for our children in this country in half. So what would the world look like? The Gloria Feld word of, or of women in equal leadership positions, what would it look like? Women running half our companies and countries, men running half our homes. I think it would look pretty good. Here's what the data tells us. We know our economic growth would be faster because we'd be using the full talents of our workforce. 
We know our companies and our nonprofits and our government would be more productive because all the studies of diversity tell us that when you have more diverse decisions and using the full talents of your workforce, productivity and performance go up. We also know that our homes would be happier. We know that couples who share responsibility more evenly have happier lives together, more sex. That New York Times piece from like a week ago, that was wrong. It was based on a 1990s study. That's not true. Happier, more sex, very motivating for many people. <laughs> and we know that at any level of income, no matter how active a mother is, children with more active fathers do better. They're better emotionally, they do better in school, and they do better in the workforce. Along with my book, I founded a nonprofit called leanin.org, and we're building a global community. Come join us on Facebook or on our website. We did launch, as was mentioned in the intro, a great program with Getty last week, so that images of women can be real women with real bodies doing real things. So when you search... When you search corporate women, you don't see women in short skirts and high heels climbing a ladder. You see women at work. <laughs> Lori McKenzie, who runs the Stanford Institute for Gender Studies at Women, wrote me a great email. She said, thank God you launched this. A year ago, I searched for uh, women with wrenches, and I got women in negligee holding wrenches. <laughs> The most important thing Lean In is doing is forming circles. Circles are any group of people, it can be women, it can be men, it can be mixed, who agree to get together once a month and support each other. There's a lot of data out there which tells us what we already know is that peers are so powerful. We know this from everything from microcredit to health groups, but a group of people who agree to meet once a month to support each other can make all the difference. The anniversary of the book launch, book's launch will be next month. I was hoping we'd have 1,000 circles up and running by then. We are close to hitting 14,000 in 50 countries. And, and importantly, these small groups really have the, have the power to change lives. You can go on our website and join one or sign up to start one. It's leanin.org. Over the last year, the most moving experiences I've had have been those chances to sit down with circles. I sat down with a group in Beijing, 29, 12 women, 29, 30 years old. In China, if you turn 27 and you are not married, you are told you are left over because your value as a woman comes from being married. Of that group, two are married, the rest are not. And I sat there as they talked about how meeting every month as a circle gave them power to define their own lives, to know that they weren't left over at all. They were making their own decisions. We launched our Lean In on Campus program at Howard University. I believe there are circles starting here at ASU, and if not, go start them. I asked the question of this audience, have you been called bossy? Yeah. <laughs> yes, always. Were you called bossy as a childhood? And every hand went up and one woman stood out from the back and she said, how was I called bossy as a child? I was called bossy last week. <laughs> one of the things that's really important as we work on issues for women is we recognize that race plays a major role too. Leadership for a long time has looked white and looked male and it is expected to look white and male. That's why if you're a woman, you're an unexpected and sometimes disliked leader, and if you are a woman of color, it's even harder. Lean In has a new edition coming out next month, and there's a great chapter by my friend Melody Hobson on issues of race and gender and how they play together. And in Minneapolis, I met with a circle, and they just sent me the Lean In Valentine's Day. Lean In Valentine's cards. One of them said, you can lean into me anytime. And one of them said, my love for you has no glass ceiling. <laughs> but I think the power and the creativity of women and men, but women standing for women, helping women to stand up, helping women to raise their hands, nothing can be stronger. There's nothing we can't do if we work together. At Facebook, where I work, we have these red posters all over the wall. Done is better than perfect. That's how I get through my days, reassuring myself of that. Fortune favors the bold, 
And my favorite, what would you do if you weren't afraid? So I want to ask you that. What would you do if you weren't afraid? Take a minute. What would you do if you believed you could do anything? If you believed that, like any man, you could have a career and a kids, you probably will. Or you could decide you don't want a career or you don't want children. You can decide anything you want on your own terms. Feeling full self-confidence for what you can do. Not letting fear of anything hold you back. So I want you to take a minute. We're going to go back to where we started. And I want you to stand up if you can think of that one thing you would do. Whether it's be a CEO, whether it's run something, whether it's do something for yourselves, think of the one thing you're going to do and stand up. The one thing you're going to do. One thing. This is a commitment. It's not a commitment to me, but it's a commitment to yourselves. To reach high, to believe in yourselves, to take the lead. Thank you.